If you have over $200,000 sitting stagnant in your bank, retirement account, or home equity, then you're literally losing money. On this show, you learn how to get that money working for you consistently and conservatively. Learn to grow your nest egg with your host, Sean Winslow. Let's dive in. Welcome back to another Multifamily Monday episode. I'm your host, Sean Winslow, and this is the Multifamily Money Podcast. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Monday episode. We're coming at you all things multifamily real estate investing. I got a great guest for you today. Um, We're kind of aligned and similar in a lot of aspects. But before I get into that, a little housekeeping, as always, you you know the drill. If you found value in this episode, please, please share it with someone who you Thing could also get value from this episode. And I'm sure a lot of you will get value from, from today's guest. So again, share. That's how we get in front of more ears and eyes. You know, don't don't market this. This is from you guys, word of mouth, referral, and getting it out to the masses. And as always, if you could leave a rating and review either on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, that helps as well. And I just want to give a shout out to someone who did so. Um, and this is from JM Dixon 15 titled Valuable Information. Sean delivers valuable and actionable information, whether you're interested in traditional stocks, bonds, investing, or you're interested in other asset classes like real estate. Well, thank you, J.M. Dixon, 15. I appreciate that. And again, take time, leave a rating review. I much appreciate that. All right, everybody. So today's guest goes by the name of Craig Berger. And Craig, uh, similar background to me in the sense of that we both came from Wall Street, financial services industry. He was on the sell side of the business. I was on the buy side of the business. So he would sell. Um, he was a uh, equity research analyst, and you know he would sell information to my company, which then would employ it into our um, how we'd manage our funds, right? And and so we, we both were similar in the sense that we had that the, the golden handcuffs from the cushy job, job that had a lot of career trajectory. Um, but like me, he mentioned this in the show that he was sick of taking, you know. The, the countless showers when, when you feel like your morals um, and, and and kind of goals aren't aligned with 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 corporate America with Wall Street right and he also mentioned you know how he, he kind of saw the industry changing becoming more automated you know as technology was disrupting the industry he, he kind of saw the writing on the wall and he also he mentioned that he wanted to create you know a business of his own something that he could grow something that he could also grow talent employees with inside of the organization that he could then help them achieve their financial goals, which, you know, you all have heard me mention this before. That's one of my biggest goals. And, and so I'm really, I really love this episode with Craig. He dives into, you know, how he just left right out of the gate. Um, he left his, his cushy job with zero, zero doors. He mentioned he had done a couple of fix and flips there in his hometown of St. Louis, which kind of, you know, got the momentum rolling. He was able to build some systems and teams. Um, but when he left, he had he had zero doors um, under management, and now he's he's grown it to transact in over two thousand doors across mul- multiple markets. So we just kind of dive into you know why he left and then how he's accomplished this, and we we get into some technical stuff as well. For those of you that love that, you know, um, a- as we were recording this, the the Fed announced another fifty basis points of of hike on the Fed funds rate. So we discussed the debt market, we discussed the equity market raising capital in this type of market. We discuss where we think prices, cap rates are going. Um, we also discussed the type what you should be doing with operations at a time like this because we all know, you know, any anyone could look good in the last three years, but going forward it's going to take um, some serious operators to to perform well. Um, so we we'd hit on a lot of different things. Um, type of assets to be looking at. He actually started off in, in, in the D class, and he said, he still says he has some of those like legacy assets. So that that was very interesting to talk about, and um, he definitely has some stories, and he definitely cut his teeth on those. So again, this is a great episode. Don't don't want to hold it up anymore because there's a lot of a great stuff to to talk about. So buckle up and let's welcome Craig. Hey Craig, welcome to the show. Sean, thanks so much for having me. Hey, it's it's my pleasure, and thank you for taking time out of your busy day. As we were just talking, I'm really excited about this one. Craig and I have similar backgrounds in the sense that we both came from financial services world, um, different sides of the desk. Uh, he was on the sell side, 
versus the buy side. But um, cool story how how we left those cushy jobs to, as Craig was saying, you know, deal with tenants, trash, and toilets. So I'm ex- I'm excited to, you know, kind of pick his brain here and, and see one why he left, and then two, um, how he got to where he is today. Because I believe you're you've you've transacted in close to two thousand units, if not more, at this point. Um, and, and so, yeah, Craig, if you don't mind just sharing your kind of your origin story with everybody. Wow. Okay, great. Well, again, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Um, you know, I, I spent 12 years as a sell side equities analyst and had a lot of fun doing that for a long time. Um, but I wrote research every day about what other people were doing. And after a while, I didn't want to write about what other people were doing or opine or pass judgment. I wanted to do and be judged and um, really hopefully build something meaningful, build the kind of company that um, could could deliver the right company culture for our team members and employees, partners, family members of, of, of those people, and, and of course, for our, for our customers. So um, set about on this sort of long, long path and part of it was the, the, the piece of the business that I was in, um, a sell side equity research analyst was shrinking and we were getting disintermediated by the internet and by other regulatory actions. And so it just wasn't a great business anymore. Um, and, you know, I think as we continue to move forward in time and as more people's lives and jobs and careers are disrupted by technology, others will have um, you know, similarly, um, decisions to make. Do I want to go do something new? Do I want to, you know, try to hang on to what I'm doing? Um, and so on. But what I was doing sort of became less and less good. And I had a decision to make, do I want to try to be one of the last men standing or do I want to go out and, and try to build something meaningful? So really set about on this long term adventure. Um, to to build a platform. And it is a long-term thing, you know, building a platform. I think it takes a lifetime, but certainly I'd give yourself 10 to 20 years to, to really um, build something that can be meaningful, substantial with scale um, and so on. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. And this is definitely not a get rich quick type of thing. Um, and the cool thing about this is you can you can build true legacy, whereas what you and I were doing before, unless you're like the the Warren Buffett of the world, there's not there's not much legacy to to, to build there, right? Um, um, so that's really cool. How, so how did you actually start? So you left what you were doing, and uh, did you have a small portfolio at the time, or did you literally start from scratch, zero units right out of the gate? Uh, we started at zero units right out of the gate. I had done. 10 or 12 fix and flip houses back in my hometown of St. Louis. Um, these weren't, you know, $300,000 per house projects. They were 50,000 per house projects. And that gave me an opportunity to sort of learn, learn some things, start small, you know, lose a little bit of my money, make a little bit of, of, of money um, and, and sort of get my feet wet. I did that while I had a job. Um, but then thereafter, I just started started studying what other people were doing and and looking for a value opportunity that I could buy with my limited funds since I had no track record or um, you know no extensive network of friends and family or other folks that were um, committed to investing with me since I had no experience so we did we did deploy into a 95 unit deal it was super inexpensive even back in 2015 um, uh, and it was a you know sub 400,000 of total equity project and we just jumped in and, and and started learning the business from the inside out Wow so I'm assuming at the, at that uh, price point or at that level of equity it was probably a, a rougher project I don't know if it was in a, a rougher neighborhood or if it was just a lot of capex that that had to be deployed but um tell me tell me about that because I'm, I'm sure you you know, cut your teeth on that one for sure. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's definitely a, a lower demographic location. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to be the property manager for six weeks when my wow. the property manager that I inherited decided she didn't want to do actual work. 
Um, she quit on the first of the month with basically no notice. And I stopped what I was doing, flew into town and collected rent. But, you know, when you sit in that chair and collect rent and be the property manager, um, well, at least for me, it, it certainly gave me a certain um, understanding of how important that job is, how challenging that job can be, how impactful on people's lives it can be. And it's an experience that I carry forward with me today when I deal with our property staff in terms of um, appreciating them, being able to tackle issues together, being able to have collaborative and engaged um, two-way conversations and free flow of ideas on how to lease up or how to deal with with problem tenants or a tenant that may be on the on the borderline. Hey, do we want to you know second give give a second or third chance to this tenant or 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 you know um, part ways and and end the relationship? And it's just um, it's been you know helpful to to have gone through that. I think if I didn't do that, I would sort of have a different perspective and a different um, maybe maybe lesser appreciation for how hard the property manager, assistant manager, leasing roles can be at these deals. But yeah, it is a, you know, what I'd call a D asset. And, um, you know, we bought, we bought for 14 a door and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's done well. Yeah. And, and, and you got in the game, right? At, yeah. I know when I started, you got to, you know, do what you got to do to get in the game, obviously, you know, still have checks and balances and, and it's going to pencil, but you know, you got to do what you got to do. And I didn't, I didn't love how I got into the game, but how did you get into it? So I started off on the smaller side. I did small multis, um, you know, triplexes, duplexes, quads. Um, and then I just built a portfolio like that, you know, both on and off market until I got to, uh, was it 25, 25 doors. And all along, I knew I wanted to go big. I just, to your point, I didn't have the track record didn't really have the, the, the Rolodex at that time, at least I thought to make it happen. Um, and then, but after time I did, and then people saw what I was doing with the small stuff and they just, I guess they trusted me to, that would, that would translate to the bigger stuff. And so then we, we scaled up into that and, and, and we've been growing that since. And we, we focus primarily Carolinas and Georgia. We do have some assets in, uh, Virginia, um, and New Hampshire as well, but primarily those those three states awesome story yeah and, and, and to your point i think it's it's great to, to start off like learning like doing it yourself i know there's a lot of gurus out there that promote like just partner and get on get on a big asset right out of the gate but what i've seen happen is is yeah you can do that but you're not really involved in the day-to-day -day stuff and i don't really feel like you're you're learning so um at least not the, not the ins and outs of, of running an asset so i I, I like I, lo I love what I had to do and and I, I think your story really highlights that that you were boots on the ground and you actually learned how to operate these assets um, I don't know if you have any more to add add on, add to that well look I mean if if you want to be successful with your assets it's a very intensive effort um, it's very process oriented you have to pay attention to all the details you have to be totally on top of on top of everything that the staff is doing, whether it's your direct staff or the third party management staff, you know, you have to have your, your list of things to do and stay on people. You have to have your, you know, various spreadsheets that are filled out weekly and monthly, right? We're in December. So what leases are expiring in February? Which residents are going to renew? Which are likely to depart? Who's a great resident? Who's a less than great resident? And, you know, what are what world rents? What are new rents? You know, proposed new rents going to be? And we need to know what's happening in February and March, um, or at least begin to plan for that here in December. So it's not a casual process. It's a very intensive process. Um, in terms of doing it, if there's any people out there that want to build experience, reach out to me and um, you can ask, you can help asset manage my, my deals, but we'll put you to work and we're going to make you do work. Yep. Yep. And, and to highlight that it, what I've learned is all that stuff you're talking about comes down to communication between all team members. You know, you need to know, like to your point, when rents, you know, when leases are, are ending 
and you need to know what are those units are just going to be a simple turn and, and what, what's going to be a renovation. So then you can pass, communicate that to your renovation crew um, or your turn crew. Um, and that, that's what I learned early on that there's no such thing as over communication. Um, and it, it, it can make or break you. you. You can you can get to one month, turn the page on the next month, and all of a sudden you have 20, 20 vacant units that you, you weren't told about. And that's not good. Um, Absolutely. So, um, so, and look, also some of it's, you know, the environment too, right? The environment can change, right? Sometimes it's it's choppier than, than at other times. I mean, even though, you know, COVID hit in 20, there was a lot of, you know, assistance money and, and, and um, social services money and PPP money for, you know, some of the, the, the blue collar workforce clientele. And now most of that money has, has dried up. So you kind of have to bob and weave and zig and zag with the environment and, and stay nimble. You know, that's sort of another, another thing we're, we're dealing with right now, but a lot of communication with the team and a lot of expectation setting and, and holding people accountable. And hopefully you've hired well and, and, you know, have talented people on your team because it is, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing passive about multifamily other if you're an LP, LP investor is passive, but if you own, there's nothing really passive about, about this business. Yeah, nothing at all. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Unless you're LP to your point. Um, but talking about the changing market, Craig, have, have you guys changed anything on how you're doing business from you know an underwriting perspective, operations? Maybe you're shying away from a certain um, sector of the asset class. I don't know if you can enlighten us on that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's um, things that have changed at the at the property level in terms of operations, and then there's things that have changed at the sourcing level, just in in light of the current environment. But the reality is, the C class properties, the C class renters, are stretched to the limit right now because of you know rising inflation and energy costs, and and you know, I think we're starting to see relief on the inflation front, which is which is good. I feel like. Prices have stopped going up for the most part at this point, um, but you know, folks are, are you know, costs went up a lot and wages went up less. So um, folks definitely have less money to pay, and and you know, also we had you know two and a half years of eviction moratorium, and you know, when when tenants hear that for a year, two years, more than that, it it, it creeps into their psyche, and some of these tenants think, well. I don't have to pay the rent anymore or it's too hard or, you know, I'll take a hit on my credit report and get max free rent and, and, and move on to the next situation. So, you know, at the property level, we are doing a lot more, you know, verification of, of payroll stubs because there's been a lot of fraudulent pay stubs out there. We're doing a lot more driver's license verifications. We're calling, you know, previous um, couple landlords sourcing those numbers online ourselves, not just accepting whatever phone number the applicant gives us. We're, you know, doing the same thing with employers, really looking for folks that have been in a job for at least six months and independently verifying that with a phone number found online as opposed to those that are just given to us. So all of these, you know, um, procedures to, to try to limit the bad debt because bad debt has been it's been high in 2022 i know it depends on the market it depends on the demographic and and what class of, of property you're dealing with but for us in in texas this year it's been painful i know atlanta's going through a huge wave right now um and and other markets so it's it's not the easiest time and you know, part of that is 20 and 21 i'm like wow this is great things are holding up better than I hoped. And, you know, anytime you go above trend line, you have to go below trend line. Um, and the area above and the area below have to more or less e equal out and, and even out. So we're, we're going through that right now. And those are some of the operational things that we're doing um, in light of the current environment. In terms of sourcing and, and acquisitions, you know, us and the whole world are sort of I think gravitating away from the C assets a little bit more towards the, you know, the A's and B's or maybe the B pluses. I know 70s deals are a lot harder to get done right now with investors. Um, people want 2000 or newer. 
maybe 1990 or newer. Um, you know, I still think there's great opportunities in some 70s deals and some 80s deals, but it really has to be just a home run slam and basis to get the equity off the sidelines right now and to compensate us as owners and investors for the bad debt trends that we're seeing at those C-class deals, because that's what 70s and 80s assets are. They're lower rent deals, attracting more of a blue blue collar kind of um, clientele. And, and we need to be, you know, risk adjusted, compensated for taking those assets on and enticing our equity partners to, to deploy into those assets. So it has to be an amazing basis. We're starting to see that, but it's still, you know, a lot easier to pitch a 90s or 2000s deal than a than a 70s or 80s deal. Yep. No, that's that's for sure. And I've I've heard that that's like a common trend I've heard too. And it, especially with the, the delinquency, because we you know it, that comes down to operations to take care of that. But we're definitely seeing that, or at least deals I've been looking at that are you know B minus C deals. It's definitely ticking up. Um, no, but thanks for sharing that. And I guess my question next would be on the debt side of things. Obviously, you know, the Fed's been increasing rates and they're probably continue to do so. I don't know if it's been released yet, but they're um, supposed to be releasing that today as we speak, which I think most people, uh, yep, Fed raises by 50 basis points um, and signals more increases likely. So one, looking at the, the forward curve, where, where, you know, I think most, I think the forward curve is projecting that it c- comes down in 24. Obviously it's a crapshoot. You can't really, it's hard to predict that, but what, what do you feel? Do you feel that's kind of accurate? How are you guys um, looking at that when you're looking at deals and, and what kind of debt are you looking at? Are you looking, or are you more looking for assumable loans right now? Well, assumable loans are great. Um, if I can get a, you know, two two seven five rate for the next 10 years, then by all means, hopefully, we don't have to shift 100% of the value of that loan to the sellers and we as buyers can benefit from some of that as well. Um, uh, but, you know, those are those are the exception, not the rule in this market. So, you know, we're really looking for Freddie Floater type of execution in this environment because I think rates are going to come down over the next 12, 24, 36 months. And I don't want to be locked into a 10 year fanny fixed with a huge defeasance prepayment penalty, um, you know, that I'm regretting uh, with nine years left to go on my loan yeah. and with no, no flexibility to, you know, to sell or, or, you know, limited, limited refi or supplemental flexibility. So we like the Freddie floater to Freddie floater sort of, um, you know, hold the floater for, you know, two to four years. And then, as it makes sense, as you execute your business plan, as rates come down and the loans are sizing better, um, refi into a new Freddie floater and sort of play that game, or maybe you refi into a fixed at that point. Um, I think that's the the smart way to go right now. You know, I do feel like the forward rate curve um, is more accurate than it was a year ago or 18 months ago. Um, it's not always right. It definitely was wrong and can be wrong. Um, I think it's a little more accurate now. It does feel disconnected from what um, the Fed's language and commentary is, right? They just raised 50 bips. They say they've got 75 bips more to go. Um, That's a lot of hiking. So, you know, the Fed made some major mistakes and they're now playing catch up. They're behind the curve. They wanna, they wanna, you know, nip this inflation in the bud and, and save face and save their credibility. So they're being really stringent. Um, I don't, I don't think we need 75 bips more. And I personally think inflation is pretty much done. Prices have stopped going up. So, you know, I think they're going to pivot in the next three or four months and we're going to be back to, you know, easing or slightly easing. And that, you know, I'm probably rambling now, but. You know, the United States is not a 4% 10-year treasury market. This country has so much debt, we cannot afford to pay 4% into perpetuity. We're a 25 to 3% 10-year treasury kind of market. 
That's where it was back in 16, 17, 18. I think that's where we're going back to. We're not going back to COVID lows of, of you know, 25 bips on the 10 year. Um, but, you know, two and a half, three percent feels normal. And if you're borrowing from Fannie Freddie at, you know, 175 to 200 bits of spread, you know, you're, you're at, you're at something like four and a quarter to 5% on your borrowing rates. And that feels kind of like where we're going to be in, you know, 12 or 18 months. So I think the forward curve is right. The Fed is, is, um, saving face and they're going to, you know, pivot in a few months. Hopefully we'll get back to more normal kind of times. I agree with you on that. Um, yeah, it's definitely not sustainable with the amount of debt the the government has. So I couldn't agree more. Um, I I guess what so what is the the outlook for for you and your business um, this year in terms of you know as is steady as is. Well, I think this is a great buying opportunity right now because a lot of people are afraid, and it's time to be greedy when others are fearful. There's a lot of fear out there. It's a very thin buyer pool. Um, instead of competing against 30 groups per deal, I'm competing against two, three, four groups per deal. Um, on the flip side, it's very hard to get equity investors to write a check right now, whether it's individual 100K investors or institutional investors. The whole world is contracting. The credit, the credit cycle is contracting. So you know, the reason there's only two or three or four bidders per deal is because you know, nobody's putting out equity right now, or if they are, it's almost all pref equity. Um, and, you know, that's not a always a comfortable place to be. Nope. Um, so, you know, we, we think the higher interest rates are temporary and we think, you know, cap rates fall, fall back down towards that um, Freddie fixed cost of debt, sort of where I think cap rates from institutional, institutionally sized multifamily are, they're sort of, Freddie um, Fannie fixed debt plus or minus 50 bips. So if I'm borrowing from Fannie at 475, let's call it 18 months from now, I think cap rates are in a 425 to 525 sort of range, you know, give or take. Um, uh, and so I think it's a great opportunity to, to, to buy low and, and, um, improve the, the quality. Um, and the age of your assets, the quality of your assets and demographics and so on. Um, you know, hopefully sellers will come around to lower prices and there'll be a little more deal flow next year because the deal flow has been really light, um, as prices have come down. Yeah, agreed. I, I've definitely noticed that, yeah, prices have come down, but it's seller expectations are still not aligned with current market conditions. And to your point, I hope. I hope that spread narrows as we enter 23. Um, you know, and I get it from their perspective. They bought at a certain point and they need to, they need to hit a certain return. But at the end of the day, we're, we're in a market and buyers, if you're smart, you're only going to buy when it makes sense. So I hope you're right. I hope it continues to, to come down. And, and, but also to your point, I agree with you. I think where there's been a lot of conversation where people think cap rates are going to decompress substantially more. I, don't see that the case. I I feel cap rates from here on out will trade in a tighter uh, like band. I, I just feel it's becoming more and more. I don't know if Main Street's the right term, but it's just becoming more and more popular investment. So I I you know we all know what's going on in the bond market. So in, whether you're institutional or or not, you need yield, and I feel like this that's where money's going to go to get it. So. If you're underwriting an institutional asset to a six exit cap, you're not going to be buying much right now um, or in the future. Um, look, some some sellers have to sell, and I'm excited for the bridge debt deals that that you know were were put into place in 20 that are going to come due in 23. Those folks have to sell or cash in refi, so we are going to see more selling next year from those deals. Um, but other other sellers are smart and they're saying, hey, rates are going to come down. The environment is going to normalize. We're going to get past this Fed tightening cycle. And I'm fine waiting 12, 15, 18 months till I get a better price. Like I I understand their logic on that and I don't yeah. I don't disagree. So, you know, we're going to try to make hay while we can and and 
try to be aggressive in, in 23 on buying. Hopefully there's there's um, product to buy and still still a, a less thin um, buyer pool of, of competitors that I'm competing against. Yep. And if you don't mind, how, how are you structuring these deals from an equity perspective? Because as you said, it is getting tougher, especially if, if you're going solely after retail investors to have them stroke continuous check after continuous check. A lot of LP institutional LPJV investors are either on the sidelines right now or have pivoted to what they perceive to be lower risk pref equity investments. Um, I don't, I've taken a bunch of pref. I don't have a problem with pref, but if these guys are only going up to 82% of the capital stack and you're doing a 50, a 50 million dollar deal, you still need to bring nine million of common equity to the deal. That's a lot of scratch. Um, and you know, it is harder to raise common behind pref. Some folks will, some folks won't. It depends on how they're compensated and so on. Um, but you know, that's not easy. So if everybody's only pref, like where's the common? So, right. you know, I don't understand how, how deals are going to get done with that. I do think some of these institutional equity providers will, will pivot back to common next year, but it's really, really hard right now. Um, so, you know, every deal we do sort of has its own ownership structure, investor structure. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going out and leveraging the institutional relationships that we've built and trying to, trying to align the deal with the, with the best fitting capital provider and, and getting people excited for juicier returns because that's sort of what, you know, buying low is never comfortable, but this is what buying low feels like. So trying yeah. to just, you know, keep that front and center with, with our potential partners. Yeah. And I think that's important. The education to your partners too. Like this is a different time than it was, you know, eight, 12, 24 months ago. Um, and it's not going to feel the same. And I, it, sometimes that's a struggle, like educating them because they, they're just like the sellers are conditioned to sell at a certain price. The, our partners are, are conditioned to, you know, feel a certain way when they're investing and get a certain, you know, outsized return. So I don't know if you've had any struggle with that or, or if you have any, you know, recommendations to, uh, to others out there, how to kind of project or, or explain how times are different and get, get, get that across. You know, when when prices were 25 percent higher and we couldn't buy enough product, it was easy to get equity. But that's that's exactly when you need to be the most cautious and, and risk averse. Now, prices have come down. A lot of the, the risk is out of the out of the picture right now. So, you know, we we both lived on Wall Street for a long time and we've we've seen this. You sort of, you know, have to be contrarian and. Yeah. um get away from the herd mentality or maybe bet against the herd if you if you want to make money. And look, sometimes that takes conviction and having that conviction, it might not be a one month or three month or six month thing. It might take 18 months before, before it pans out or in some cases longer. I mean, I know investors who said, well, this market's crazy overpriced back in 2018. And, you know, obviously it, it, it went a lot higher. Um, now, now maybe it's back to 2018 pricing for, you know, this narrow buying opportunity. Um, but, you know, we just try to mind investors that if you want to make money, you need to be somewhat contrarian and, um, you know, that this is what buying low feels like. It's never comfortable. Yeah. And, and that whole, uh, you know, be greedy when others are fearful thing. That's, it's easier said when things are, you know, doing well and you're like, uh, all right, well, well, let, let me wait until it, 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 people get fearful. But when they are, then that's it's tougher to act. And I get it. But I, I think to your point that when you feel that way, that's the time to act, obviously, in a sensible manner. But that's the time to act. Um, well, look, we have talked with a bunch of guys that are basically professional fundraisers and their volume. And, in, in, you know, over the last six months, it's down 75, 80 percent. So investors, you know, once once the stock market sort of crapped out in, in May, um, investors really put, you know, put investing on pause. So, you know, all the syndicators out there are kind of out of the market right now. You know, it's just really hard to 
to get money. And I'm, I'm, I'm a part syndicator also. So that's a piece of my business. And, um, you know, getting people to invest right now is, is hard and you really need a slamming deal, hopefully positive leverage day one. And, you know, they're still not that easy to find. No, def, def, definitely not. And to your point on the stock market, it's funny how that happens. When when the market's down, they're like, yeah, but I, I can't pull my money out because then, you know, you know, I've, I've lost, you know, but then when the market's up, they're like, I, but I can't take my money out because I'm doing so well. So it's, you, you get that roller coaster as well. And, but I, to that, I think it's just continuous education. And, you know, I've had people start to move, to move money more than, than they have in the past. And even now, just because they, they're sick of that ride, right? They're sick of that emotional, emotional ride. So I, I think it's just important to just keep in front of, in front of your, your partner, your investor partners. Um, well, look, well the, the stock market is a ride. By the way, one of the reasons I like being a multifamily operator is I've never been that great of a day trader. And um, if you're in the stock market, your most, you know, your best bets just buy a diversified basket of very low fee iShares and other ETFs and um, pay low fees and, and, and you're riding the ups and downs and it is an emotional roller coaster. I like multifamily, at least what I'm doing, is I can control more uh, of my outcomes. I buy low. I buy in areas that are that are growing population and jobs. Um, I'm executing a value add and upgrading apartment interiors and, you know, getting a little bit more rent for the value that we're delivering for our customers. I'm, you know, uh, just in control of my destiny a lot more with multifamily than I ever was on the stock market where I'm just riding the ride and it is an emotional roller coaster. The other just sort of funny thing about it is, you know, a lot of my buddies work in hedge funds from when I was in the industry, but almost none of the hedge funds that I've interacted with are actually hedged. So they're not hedged. Yeah. They're not long, short, delta neutral or within a 10 or 20% long or short um, band. And uh, so it's a little bit of a misnomer. And, you know, that business is a little bit of heads I win, tails you lose, sort of yep. a one tailed outcome for the hedge fund operators. And you know, we're not in that same situation on the multifamily side. If I don't hurdle a seven or eight IRR at the end of the project five years from now, I'm really not going to make any meaningful economics as an operator. And I'm truly aligned with my investors. And I, I feel good about that. I wake up in the morning and feel good about that arrangement, aligned interests with our investors. I feel good about what we're doing for our residents at the property level. And I just, you know, feel like I don't need as many showers as I felt like I needed on, on Wall Street. So, you know, just a sort of, you know, sidebar comment on on that emotional roller coaster of being in equities and really not having control unless you're truly hedged and active and watching your your positions hour by hour and potentially minute by minute. Yeah. And Craig, that's that's you hit it on the the nail on the head for me right there. That's part of the reason I left is the whole, you know, not needing showers, right? I was sick of that feeling. Um but uh if you if you could give some advice um on the LP side to a limited partner, you kind of just mentioned it mentioned it here, but what should they be looking out for in a, one, a prospective operator, but two, a prospective deal, especially in times like this? Because in the last, you know, three years, you know, anyone could look like a successful operator. But now going forward, you're really going to find out who's good and who's not. It's definitely harder um, in terms of so LP investors to 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 find great operators. I think you want to find people that, number one, have integrity, are honest. Um, and are going to be um, focused on treating their residents well, treating their investors well, and putting themselves as operators last. Um, and a big chunk of that is, again, having aligned interests and not charging a, a, a bunch of fees. You know, I shouldn't really make a lot of money if I don't perform well at the property level. Um, Obviously, you want to invest with people that that have done it, 
and have a have a track record. I do think there's a space to invest with up and com- up and comers that have that have shown promise or or delivered early results or you like their approach. Um, uh, those guys are working harder for it. Um, maybe are mo- more motivated and ambitious to succeed than folks that are already super successful, large, and maybe are less motivated. So, you know, that's that's a couple of things on finding good operators. But reasonable fees, aligned interests, integrity, honesty, track record of execution, things are sort of important to me. Um, in terms of finding deals, I mean, it's just value. What's what's the going in cap rate? What's the potential cap rate in year five? Um, how good is the area? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Um, you know, are you making your money going in on the buy and buying value? Um, you know, is it one of the Uber growth markets, Austin, Nashville, Phoenix, Vegas, you know, Raleigh, Durham, um, or is it something else? I mean, honestly, Vegas has grown so much over the last 30 years. You don't have to be smart. If you're investing in Vegas, you just have to be present really. But, um, or maybe that's different in 2022 and 23. Um, but you know, just any deal you sort of, you know, if, there, if it's a good deal, you sort of you sort of know it when you see it. It's kind of hard to hard to put a you know. I mean, we look at everything when we're buying. By the way, price per door, price per foot, going in cap rate, pro forma cap rate, post renovations, how much growth, how much job growth, how many Chick Fil A's and Paneras are opening up around there. You know, how many new new construction homes, how many new post office. We we you know. Obviously, median income is a big one. Um, median home price. What's the what's the ability for your renters to buy a home and afford that versus being being renters? Are you renting to people that have to rent? Are you renting to people that choose to rent? So, I mean, we you know, there's no one thing, but we try to look at you know everything. Yeah, yeah, I love that answer. First, when you started off, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about. You, know, you, you need to take care of not only your investors, but your residents. I think that's so important. I think that's something that's overlooked a lot by operators. Um, so at the end of the day, that's where we're there to provide quality housing. And, and I'm, I'm sure you you experienced that in, in some of the deep, the deep properties that you had. Like everyone's a person and we need to provide them them housing and quality housing. So I'm, I'm really glad you said that. And two, <laughs> I love that the Chick-fil-A reference because we do the same thing and you got to think about it chick-fil-a is the most profitable fast food chain in the country and they have a team of people doing countless hours of research on where to open the next one so if they're opening somewhere you you got to think that's it's probably for a smart reason so it, it's not going to be bad to to want to invest in that neighborhood so I love I love the the, the Chick Fil A pointer. We use that. Well, too. look on, on the resident thing. It's really important. That's our mission number one. And if we don't provide a great living experience with improved safety and security, and enhanced living experience, um, I don't think we're going to achieve our plan. I mean, there are operators out there who have the mindset of, hey, let me just buy low and sell high, and hope, hopefully the market goes up and prices go up, and they're just you know, trading properties like you might trade a stock. Um, that's not what we do. And, and personally, I think providing, a, you know, that tremendous living experience for your resident, you maximize your rents and your revenues, you maximize your financial performance, and it does feed into the investor experience and your investor return. So for us, they're not mutually exclusive certainly bought deals from operators who do feel they're mutually exclusive. And I spend the next two or three years cleaning those properties up and, and, and being, being the fixer for better, for worse. Um, but look, I, I think it's an important part of the mission and um, I like taking it on, you know, a lot of people talk about ESG, um, you know, I, who knows if it's just a buzzword or virtue signaling or what, but I'm, I'm living in that world. That's that's what we do. That's what our whole team is doing day in day out. It you know you got to take care of the asset number one, which feeds into the resident experience number two, which feeds into the LP investor experience number three, and hopefully some of that goodness will will find its way to to me and my partners at, at, at the end of a long, long effort of of business. Yeah, I love that. And 
to me, that is true ESG. What, what you know, they do on Wall Street, I'm not too sure if, if that, to your point, is just more virtual signaling. But, uh, um, but being the fixer, I think that's a great, great spot to be because you're fixing two main things. You're fixing, you know, at the property level and the, the residents' quality of life. But at the end of the day, that usually results in a pretty good profit for, for you and your partners. So I think that's a good, great spot to be in. Um, before I let you go here, I'll, I'm going to ask two last questions. But before I forget, how can listeners find you if they want to connect with you, Craig? Sure. Uh, emails, always a great way to get me, Craig at avidrealtypartners.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, reach out, always happy to, to make new relationships. Great. Thank you. And, and so first of the last two, um, one, you, you know, we just kind of, this whole conversation has been about it, but you, you left Wall Street, you were on the equity side. Why multifamily real estate as an investment vehicle? You know, you, you've, you've, seen both both sides here you've been you know institutional you know wall street why why multifamily well look some people have done great on the hedge fund side or the investment side maybe that would have been an easier easier route for me than starting over but um you know a few things one i i wanted to um do something where we were doing great things for for people and we just sort of got done with that discussion from the resident perspective um, two, I wanted to be able to deliver investor returns and hopefully um, uh, attractive sharp ratios, attractive risk-adjusted returns, non-correlated. You don't have to watch your apartment property as an LP investor every hour, every day, every week. It's a, it's a slow burn. It's a long-term play, um, and and we're going to deliver. Um, you know, personally for me, I wanted to to sort of create my own future, create my own destiny and, and build something that was mine where I had a certain amount of freedom. I don't know if I'm free. I'm probably um, more of a slave to email and phone calls and Zooms now than I ever was before, but yep. um, I can do it from wherever. We're out touring deals, we're out meeting investors. And and so there is some freedom while still being a slave to my to my business. Um, and, and fourth, I wanted to do something where I wouldn't be replaced by a computer. I felt that ownership was um, aligned with that. So, um, you know, a few of my motivations, you know, with the overarching theme of building something meaningful, you know, uh, obviously a desire for wealth, some of that's ambition, maybe there's a little ego in there, um, uh, intense desire to do great things for our residents and customers, an intense desire to, to help our employees build um, meaningful wealth, maybe even generational wealth. Um, but it is a long road. It's, you know, it's not for everyone. Um, and you have to be committed to, uh, you know, a multi-decade plan if you really want to, want to be successful and, and, and get it done. Uh, Craig, I love that. I, I feel like we're aligned on a lot of things. Um, yeah, helping empl employees grow generational wealth is one of my big aspirations. You know, there, there's nothing like helping others and see them reach their goals. Uh, last question. All right. What's a, common mistake you see newer investor operators make and, and and how can they avoid that i know there's plenty of mistakes i made I'll early give, on i'll give i'll give you two one buying for the sake of buying and not feeling strongly about making money and having a path to make money um some folks just want to grow and they think if they grow they'll be easier to grow and you know, but if you're not successful delivering investor returns, it's going to hurt you. Um, so that's one thing. I'd say another thing, just from an operational perspective, is these assets require a lot of capex. A lot of people don't get me started on broker capex estimates, but <laughs> a lot <laughs> double it, triple it sometimes, <laughs> quadruple. Yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of you know these assets require a lot, a lot of money we're never gonna buy we're never gonna buy a deal um where we don't bring at least three or four thousand a door for external deferred maintenance or future deferred maintenance um plus you know to renovate a, an apartment interior now it's it's 12 13 14 thousand a unit at least to do floors close stainless appliances upgraded fixtures lighting, you know, maybe you want to go hard surface counters. 
you know, that's 14 grand. So, yep. um, you know, between the, the 4K of, you know, amenity upgrades, current deferred maintenance, future deferred maintenance, and, you know, the insides, you do need, you know, 15 to 20K a unit of CapEx going into these deals. Even if you don't spend it all year one, if I'm going to spend my deal in year, you know, if I'm going to sell my deal in year five, I need, you know, I need to pretty up the property, put some lipstick on it, maybe paint it. You know, you don't want to sell a deal with super old roofs um, and and so on and so forth. So, you know, don't don't undercapitalize your projects. Um, you know, I guess related to that, bring enough working capital, bring enough safety capital, bring some safety cushion. Don't forget you have to pay for, you know, 14 or 15 months of insurance day one. Right. People, you know, new new folks just don't budget for all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do do that, then Craig and I will be there to, to buy it at a discount from you. So, <laughs> oh, man, uh, Craig, I really appreciate your time. Uh, you brought a wealth of knowledge to the show and, and I know listeners will get a lot out of it. I know I did. So, you know, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on. Awesome. Really enjoyed it. Um, let's hang out. If you ever come to New York City, it would be, love it. be my pleasure to treat and um you know really enjoyed this and and thank you so much yeah thank you craig and listeners as as i always say easy doesn't pay well and instant gratification is self-destructive so not only get out there and work hard for your money but have a hard work hard for you so you can create the life of your dreams all right everybody catch you on the next one hey this is sean winslow after being in the financial service industry for years and having candid conversations with good people just like you I realized that so many of us are wanting an investment strategy that provides solid returns and consistent income without the bumps in the road. There's little known secret that your financial advisor doesn't want you to know. There is investment out there that is less volatile and the returns are stronger. Get more details by going to greenbriarcg.com and clicking on the free e-report. And by the way, if this show has provided you any value, then feel free to leave an honest written review and of course, share it with a friend who needs it. See you next week for another great show.